Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started. Good morning. My name is Anna Boris, and I'm an ambassador, Kevin Harrington student ambassador here at St. Anselm College. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students here at St. Anselm College, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us for this morning's event. Before we begin our program, I'd just like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones or any other noise-making devices. Also, following Professor Cunningham's remarks, we'll have a brief question and answer period. Please wait for the microphone to ask your question. Introducing this morning's speaker is Dr. Dale Keene. Dr. Keene is a professor here in the Department of Politics and serves as Senior Fellow for the Ethics and Governance and Investor Education Program. Thank you. Thank you very much. As you know, here at St. Anselm and those of us in New Hampshire, we get to host a, w a wide variety of people, especially in the New Hampshire primary season. So we've had several people up to this podium recently, and I'm delighted to welcome yet another person up to our podium who's going to announce his candidacy. No, probably not. Um, <laughs> Professor, Cun excuse me. Professor Cunningham is an authority on corporate governance, corporate culture, corporate law. He teaches business-related courses that span these fields. He's written dozens of books, many articles on a wide range of subjects in law and business. And they include textbooks in accounting used in law schools, popular narratives on contracts, and the best-selling books such as Ber Berkshire and Hathaway and Warren Buffett, which we'll be hearing more about today. His extensive work has been published in top university reviews such as the Columbia Law Review, influential professional journals such as directors and boards, and mainstream media like the New York Times. Before joining the faculty at George Washington in 2007, Professor Cunningham taught at Boston College Law School where he served a two-year term as Associate Dean for Academic Affairs. From 1999 to 2002, he taught at the Benjamin and Cardoza School of Law at NYU where he served a five-year term as director of the Heyman Center in Corporate Governance and received the Professor of the Year Award in 2000. Professor Cunningham has also taught or visited at Columbia, Fordham, St. John's, Vanderbilt, Central European University, Hebrew University, University of Navarra and Oxford. And before entering academia, he practiced corporate law with Kravath, Swain, and Moore in New York. And we're very glad to welcome him here to St. Anselm. Please join me in welcoming Professor Lawrence Cunningham. Thanks so much for that kind introduction, and thanks to all of you for coming this morning. I don't think I could win uh, the nomination, but I, I, I think that guy could. Uh, Warren Buffett is, is seen in the middle of that photograph about 20 years ago at a conference that I organized featuring his famous letters to Berkshire Hathaway shareholders. I turned it into the, the book pictured there, the essays of Warren Buffett. Um, there to his right uh, is his uh, late wife, uh, Susan, and to his left, vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, Charlie Munger. And just at this time, it's in 1996, Warren had just reached retirement age, and people had just begun to wonder what would happen to Berkshire Hathaway after Warren Buffett was gone. They started to wonder what skills of his would the company miss the most. They wondered who would succeed him. Uh, during one panel, someone asked explicitly uh, what effect on the stock price would Warren's death have? Uh, and this is you know, right in front of uh, Susie Buffett, so Char Charlie Munger, ever the diplomat, tried to quiet things down and said, you know, this is not a subject all of us are comfortable discussing. And Warren intervened and said, look, it's, it's, don't worry, it won't be as bad for the stockholders as it will be for me. Uh, <laughs> now, 20, 20 years later, uh, people are still asking those same questions. What will happen to Berkshire after Buffett is gone? What skills will we miss? Who will succeed him and all of that? Um, and so while a lot has stayed the same, a lot has also changed in those 20 years. Berkshire Hathaway is a very different company now than it was then. Back then, 80% of Berkshire's assets were in common stock positions Warren had chosen as an investor, and he was very famous as a stock picker. Uh, today, and, and just 20% were in wholly owned businesses. Uh, today, the ratio is exactly the other way around. Only 
of Berkshire's total assets are in minority common stock positions that Warren picked as a stock picker at 80 percent are in wholly owned operating businesses. And so while Warren is rightly uh, revered as a stock picker, as an investor, uh, too little attention has been paid to his management skills. And so what I do in, in this new book, Berkshire Beyond Buffett, is, is focus on those management uh, skills. And I think that they are actually much more important and distinctive than his investment principles and much more um, uh, broadly useful by other companies, other managers, and even individuals. And certainly the management principles have a lot more to say than the investment principles about big topics in corporate life like culture, ethics, and governance. And so uh, the management principles also go a long way to answering what is now becoming a trillion dollar question, which is what will happen to Warren, Warren's creation after he's gone. The consensus seems to be that the company will go the way of the man, that uh, uh, if when Warren leaves the scene, Berkshire will meet its demise. Here are a couple of quotes from the popular press suggesting this point of view. The New York Times last year indicates that Warren has an irreplaceable magic touch. And earlier uh, last year, the economist described Berkshire Hathaway as, as now down to playing out its last hand. And I, I find comments like, like these uh, to be paradoxical. Warren Buffett's goal at Berkshire Hathaway has been to create an enduring, long-lasting corporation. And yet, even fans like these think he's failed. I uh, think he's only built an organization with his own longevity or his own mortality. The story I tell in Berkshire Beyond Buffett is the other way around. Instead of arguing, as these fellows do, that there's something so special about Buffett that Berkshire can't survive, I make the, the opposite claim. That there's something so special about Berkshire, the company, that it can endure and survive, even without the iconoclastic figure, Warren Buffett, who founded it. And I attribute this, and what I try to document in the book, the, the sense of enduring, the sense of permanence at Berkshire Hathaway, is because of a distinctive corporate culture that pervades the organization, one that is based on a set of intangible values that all the personnel in the organization, all the leadership, the managers, turn into economic value. So uh, a quick look at uh, these, the cultural traits uh, at Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, incidentally, the structure of the company, is, it's extraordinary. It's uh, made up of 60-plus uh, different wholly owned subsidiaries. I've, I've just put the logos of 10 of them there, but uh, the Dairy Queen, Justin Boots, uh, Benjamin Moore Paints, BNSF Railway. The, the subsidiaries are in just about every branch of commerce, manufacturing, retail that you can imagine. Pretty nearly everything except for high technology. Ice cream, paint, footwear, insurance, uh, and so on. And uh, yet, if when I studied these companies individually, I looked at, looked at all 60 of them and interviewed the managers and other personnel of, of many of them, despite that diversity of, of business, they all tended to be united by a core set of common values. Every, every subsidiary I looked at, one after the next, tended to reveal the same kinds of values. And so it became very easy to organize the book, describing these 60 different subsidiaries um, organized around the values I found, nine of them. They're, they're the nine uh, on the board. And so, uh, the middle part of the book uh, is nine different chapters, each featuring a story about one of the subsidiaries. And so that's the, that's the structure of the book. I weave together a, a portrait of the whole from, from views of these individual parts. And uh, <clears throat> the genesis, the source of, of these cultural values is, is the tone at the top. Uh, Warren Buffett has, has organized, has formed a company endowed with these values because these are values that, that he believes in. And, and uh, he sets the tone at the top uh, so that these values are part of the, the fabric of the subsidiaries. Uh, moreover, he, along with his colleague Charlie Munger, has selected 
these companies for acquisition and inclusion in the Berkshire family, so these companies tended to have these values when they came to Berkshire Hathaway. And so <clears throat> uh, I'd like to discuss this morning uh, the, uh, I can't discuss all, all nine of these uh, values, but I'd just like to highlight the ones that I've put there in bold, thrift and autonomy and reputation and, and permanence. Um, the reason for choosing these four is because I think that they will enable me to provide you with a very uh, comprehensive overview of what Berkshire Hathaway is, who its people are, and, and why these values are so important. So I'll do that primarily by contrasting what is special about Berkshire Hathaway compared to typical corporate American uh, companies. So first, on uh, financing. American companies borrow very heavily. They pay advisors fees to arrange loans, they pay interest to lenders, and they face the discipline borrow, uh, lenders insist upon in loan covenants. Many companies incur these costs while at the same time paying dividends to their shareholders. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway does none of that. It shuns debt as costly and avoids loan agreements because the covenants are constraining. It prefers instead to rely on itself to generate financing to make acquisitions and invest in its businesses. It uses its own money. There are three primary sources. The first is it generates abundant earnings through all of those different subsidiaries and retains 100% of those earnings. It has not paid a dividend in 50 years, instead reinvesting those funds. In 2014, Berkshire earned $20 billion, which is available for reinvestment in the businesses and to make new acquisitions. Second are deferred taxes, now totaling $60 billion. These reflect Berkshire's long holding periods, whether in wholly owned businesses or common stocks that it acquires. It bought most of these assets a very long time ago, and so it has not sold these things, and so it's deferred tax gains, and those add up to now $60 billion. These are functionally loans from the government that are interest-free and without any covenants. The third source of uh, funding at Berkshire and the principal source of leverage is insurance float. It owns three very significant insurance companies, those pictured there, Geico, which is the second largest car insurance company in the United States, National Indemnity, which is one of the largest commercial insurers in the country, and Gen Ray, which is the first or second largest reinsurance company <clears throat> in the world. Um, and these insurance businesses generate leverage for Berkshire because of something called float. This refers to premiums paid by customers ahead of time when claims on related policies only have to be paid out much later, if at all. In between the time receiving the premium and the time a claim has to be paid, Berkshire uses that money and invests that money. So it's, it's leverage. It's like borrowed money, except there's no interest rate, there are no covenants, there are no due dates. And so long as the underwriters writing policies are prudent and disciplined in what risks they cover and what prices they charge, float can be zero cost or even negative cost. Berkshire can be paid for holding float. At year end uh, 2014, uh, the cumulative float at Berkshire totaled $72 billion, a huge amount of money available. Uh, as with uh, the deferred taxes and, and the retained earnings to reinvest in businesses and to make new acquisitions. Within Berkshire Hathaway, some subsidiaries generate um, more cash than they can use to reinvest in their businesses. Others need more uh, cash. And so Berkshire serves as a middleman essentially to reallocate the funds from companies that generate more cash than they need to companies that that need more cash. So in my picture there, I have uh, Seize Candies, which Berkshire acquired in 1971, 
of ch maker of uh, box chocolates based in California that is a very solid, steady company, but doesn't have a lot of growth opportunities. And so it generates uh, hundreds of, over its lifetime at Berkshire, it's generated hundreds of millions of dollars that it could not use to reinvest in its business. So it sent those hundreds of millions of dollars to Berkshire's headquarters. Uh, which then turned around and allocated those funds to companies that could use the, the money uh, to expand, which in, have included uh, flight safety, uh, the leading trainer of pilots in the world, and Acme Brick Company, which is one of the leading sellers of makers of, of bricks. The rationales for this r internal reallocation are, again, thrift and autonomy. The company is making uh, tax-free, interest-free transfers among the various subsidiaries without covenants, without the hassles. The subsidiary manager who needs cash doesn't need to go to Bank of America or J.P. Morgan and negotiate a loan agreement. They call headquarters. They call Warren Buffett and say, I have an opportunity to expand the brick-making facility on like $100 million. And he says, terrific. Uh, and <laughs> that's, the, that's the end of it. So um, the virtues of self-reliance and self-discipline underlie Berkshire's financing. On acquisitions, most companies in America have acquisition programs based on strategic plans and typically have a department on staff that scouts for acquisitions and, and negotiates and closes them. These uh, staff uh, members typically rely on business brokers and investment bankers to find deals. Those firms typically charge fees to, and they have incentives to get deals done. Fees are paid if deals close and not otherwise. Companies also tend to use consultants, accountants, lawyers, engineers, and others to conduct due diligence on acquisition targets ahead of closing a deal. Berkshire has never done any of that. There is no acquisitions department. They hardly ever have used a banker or a broker to find deals. They do very limited due diligence. They never hire lawyers, accountants, or bankers to conduct it uh, for them. How did the, all this happen? Well, in the early days, in the mid 1980s, Warren Buffett took out an advertisement in the Wall Street Journal saying Berkshire Hathaway is interested in making acquisitions, and he set out the criteria, the kinds of companies that they were looking for, uh, and he signaled to the marketplace that this is what Berkshire stands for and this is what we'll do. Uh, since then, Berkshire has built an incredible network of people who refer opportunities to it, free of charge, friends, families, business associates, and most significantly, people who have previously sold businesses to Berkshire who can vouch for what the company is all about. When acquisition opportunities appear, uh, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger evaluate the opportunity themselves. They look at the financial statements, they think about the business, and they interview the managers. They don't hire accountants, lawyers, advisors, and, and so on to do their work for them. They rely on themselves. Uh, they don't conduct due diligence. Uh, but this isn't because they're reckless or, uh, or foolish, but instead because they have invested so much in knowing about American businesses. They read gargantuan volumes of material, annual reports, uh, uh, analysts, uh, reviews, and so on, so that when acquisition opportunities come, they, they, they tend to have an understanding of, of the business and its economic characteristics ahead of time to make an informed decision about whether it's an opportunity they'd like to take. And if they lack that knowledge, they pass on the opportunity. They've also developed a very strong sense of the boundaries of their own knowledge. And so if something is not, outside of their circle of competence, something they don't understand and can't evaluate, they skip it. Corporate America has now adopted a governance system in which boards of directors have become very expensive bureaucracies. Directors are monitors for managers. They meet monthly and use many committees. Committees in turn hire consultants, accountants, and lawyers, uh, all of whom tend to work year-round and charge considerable fees. Directors of corporate America are now very well paid most of them at larger companies earning six figures for being a director of a company, including considerable stock compensation, often in stock options. And the companies in corporate America typically buy uh, liability insurance for directors in case they're ever uh, sued. Berkshire, Berkshire's board does none of that. <laughs> uh, in contrast, it follows what used to be called the advisory model of the board of directors, which was very common in corporate America until the 1980s. This is a, uh, a board of directors whose job is to be very interested in the corporation, 
uh, in Berkshire's case, these people tend to be uh, include friends and family of uh, of, of Warrens. Um, they are there because they believe in Berkshire Hathaway. They understand its values. They appreciate uh, what Warren has done. They support him. They're not trying to oversee him or second guess him, but facilitate uh, the mission, the 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 uh, the strategy that that he has put in place. They um, have very few committees. They have virtually no hired advisors. They meet two or three times a year, um, and they're paid virtually nothing. They're paid a thousand dollars a meeting, and they're not paid in stock or anything like that. Uh, but on the other hand, well, they're all significant shareholders of Berkshire Hathaway. They bought the stock with their own money, and and that's why they're on the board because they care very much about their investment. Um, some of them have uh, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars of, of stock in, in Berkshire Hathaway, and, and that's why they're there. There's a picture of the uh, shareholder meeting of Berkshire Hathaway in Omaha from, from last year. This is a, a rock concert style gathering that's utterly unique and unprecedented in corporate America. 39,000 people attended last year's meeting. Um, this year is the 50th anniversary of the company. It's next weekend. Uh, they expect more than 50,000. Uh, this is a very, very unusual group of shareholders, very unlike any other group of owners in corporate America. For most shareholders in corporate America uh, are large financial institutions. More than half the, the, the equity of the largest corporate uh, corporations in America are owned by hedge funds, uh, insurance companies, pension funds and other large financial institutions, stock trading in typical American companies is very high. The volume of trading is, is very significant. Portfolios uh, tend to be rebalanced uh, on a regular basis in order to have an appropriate weighting of, uh, of stocks and bonds and U.S. and non-U.S. companies and so on. Uh, all of this action creates considerable fees for stockbrokers, stock advisors, uh, hedge funds, private equity funds, and so on all at a significant cost to investors. Again, Berkshire Hathaway is totally different. Berkshire Hathaway stockholders tend to trade very little in the stock. They tend to have very long holding periods. They're mostly people, not institutions. They're families, individuals, or family offices who hold their stock, not through the big giants like Fidelity and T. Rowe Price, but through boutique sorts of firms who tend to specialize in Berkshire stock. Uh, Berkshire share turner, turnover is very low. Um, most of the shareholders have most of their net worth in Berkshire stock. They concentrate rather than diversify, which is totally different from the, from the norm. This inaction saves the stockholders enormous amounts of money from stockbroker fees to stock exchange fees and the rest. Furthermore, shareholders of most companies in corporate America don't read the annual reports, considering it not to be productive use of time. They don't attend the annual meetings. At many meetings in corporate America, you'll have a couple hundred shareholders at most. There are dozens appear at, at quite a few of them, just dozens. Um, to have a turnout like this is truly extraordinary. Why, why, is all this, why has all this happened? Well, it's, I think, at bottom because of how uh, the tone that Warren has set at the top. At most uh, corporations in America, what you, what you have is a, is a hierarchy. Corporate, corporations are designed as, as hierarchies. You have a board of directors at the top, managers underneath of them, all working for shareholders who are seen to own a residual stake in the corporation. The claim on the firm's assets after assets have been allocated to discharge liability. So boards and managers very often treat stockholders as inputs into a production function, into that hierarchy. Buffett has defined Berkshire very differently. He said, despite our corporate form, our attitude is partnership. We don't consider you as inputs into a production function. We consider you as partners. Me, Charlie, all the board members, managers of the company's own stock, we're all 
on the same level. This is not a hierarchy. We all own shares, and we are all in this together. This is a legacy. This attitude of partnership is a legacy from when Buffett started out from the mid-50s to uh, the mid-60s when he acquired Berkshire, he had run an investment partnership whose investors were friends and family members, and he took that attitude of partnership very, very seriously. Um, when, through a form of accident, he stumbled on and acquired Berkshire Hathaway, it was a corporation. He came to control it, and he came to invest all of his partner's uh, money in that corporation, but he never forgot that the partnership was its origin, the partnership was its attitude, and he's behaved that way uh, ever since. It is a radical and profound idea, just to take one example. Um, he sees the corporation, um, I said before, that standard conception of the corporation has shareholders as residual claimants on firm's assets after creditors have been paid. At, at Berkshire, he says, we see the corporation as a conduit through which shareholders own the assets directly. Not residual claimants on anything, but co-owners of the assets directly. I mean, that, that's an, a profound and radical proposition. And he takes it very seriously. And indeed, the stockholders do too. They share that sense of partnership. And that's why you get turnouts at the meeting like you do. Most corporate boards set dividend policy at regular periodic amounts invariant to business conditions. Uh, General Electric likes to pay $2 a quarter, uh, increasing by a dime every, every, along the way. Walmart does the same thing. Most companies' boards try to, try to do it that way. Um, Berkshire, uh, and, and they also tend to split the stock. If the stock price ratchets up above a comfortable trading level, $300 or four, five dollars the board of directors splits the stock so that it trades at a level that people can uh, readily afford. That keeps people interested in trading in it. Berkshire has never done that. I already said they've never paid a dividend, nor have they ever um, split the stock as a matter of, uh, of policy. Instead, they have always said, we will set our dividend policy based on business conditions. We will retain cash if we can reinvest it each dollar to increase the market value of your stock by at least a dollar. And if we cannot do that, we will distribute uh, the funds. So they've got a formal test for when they will pay a dividend. They've managed to meet that test, and so they've never paid a dividend. And they've polled it sh their shareholders about whether the shareholders like this dividend policy on, on two separate occasions. They've, they've uh, no other company in corporate America has polled their shareholders to see what sort of dividend policy uh, the shareholders preferred. And on both of the occasions when Berkshire has done it, overwhelming majorities approved the dividend policy. Most recently, this happened two years ago. Um, and it's never split the stock to keep the price low. Uh, on the contrary, is an uh, extraordinary uh, example of the, the partnership attitude, the, the opposite attitude. Uh, Go back to 1996, the year I had that conference. Berkshire's stock was then trading at $36,000 a share, all right, way out of the comfort range for you know it's nowhere near $300 or $200, and so it was unaffordable for a lot of people. Um, that doesn't bother Berkshire's leadership. They they want people who hold the stock forever. So having a cheap uh, cheap dollar value is not a, not interesting at all to them. But at at that time, some entrepreneurs got the idea that they could create special trusts, unit investment trusts, where they would buy Berkshire stock at thirty six thousand or whatever it was, and then slice up um, unit trusts uh, to sell them for you know, $500 or $300. So they were about to do this uh, so that all of us could own a little bit of Berkshire Hathaway. They were about to do this. And, um, you know, this, this is inconsistent with Berkshire's philosophy, right? They don't want these kinds of, uh, you know, trading and, and associated costs and short-term thinking and all of that. Um, and it particularly didn't appreciate the fees that these fellows would have been charging. And so um, uh, Munger and, and Buffett came up with an idea that they, they created, a, they amended the corporate charter to create a second class of stock. Uh, there'd be the class A stock that's still trading at 36,000, but there'd be a new class B stock with 1 30th of the voting rights, 1 30th of the economic rights, and so it would trade in within that comfortable level. And um, uh, Berkshire offered this class B stock 
on unlimited terms. As many shares as uh, would be bought, they would offer. And uh, so uh, a very large number of uh, shares were issued and, and were acquired, and it just um, decimated the, the, uh, the proposal uh, of these fellows who were going to market uh, the unit trust. So this is an extraordinary example of, uh, of, of Berkshire's effort to, to maintain this, this kind of, of corporate culture. And a final example of this sort of partnership attitude concerns corporate charitable giving. At most companies, the chief executive officer names the donees to which the corporation shall uh, give money, whether it's uh, his or her alma mater or favorite, um, favorite organization. Uh, that would be absolutely anathema at, at, at Berkshire Hathaway, right? It's in total contradiction to the, any notion of partnership. So instead at Berkshire Hathaway, they invented a, uh, ch a shareholder um, charitable giving program where the board would set the dollar amount in aggregate the corporation would allocate to charity, but then each shareholder got to allocate her pro rata portion of that to the charities of his or her choice. Uh, and it's extraordinary, isn't it? Totally unique in, in, in corporate America. It's never happened anywhere else. And all of that in the spirit of partnership. Uh, finally, to introduce some of the managers at, at Berkshire Hathaway and the, what, what is so special about this organization from an operational standpoint, most corporations use uh, centralized management structures with uh, headquarters uh, staffed with departments like uh, accounting and legal and human resources and, and technology. There's a, a cadre of middle managers who oversee the operations of the various uh, units. Um, there are regular meetings, budgeting reviews, uh, personnel reviews. Um, there are internal control manuals and policies and procedures and training programs and so on, and a lot of supervision and second guessing. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway, as you might uh, not be surprised to hear at this stage, has none of that. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway's headquarters is, consists of 24 people uh, in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, there are 60 plus subsidiaries that, to that employ a total of 350,000 people around the world. Um, Berkshire has $600 billion in assets. Uh, you know, it, ge it generates <laughs> $200 billion in revenue. Uh, I already told you its profits, uh, $40 billion. It's, it's a huge operation, but has no centralized functions at all, other than internal financial reporting. Um, uh, how does it do that? Well, it pushes down all of those uh, managerial mandates to the subsidiary levels, and the managers of each unit have total responsibility for their unit. There's 60 plus of them. I've just pictured 15 or so of the, of the leaders of these, these companies. Uh, and uh, what communications occur between Berkshire headquarters and these fellows varies by person. Some of these CEOs have never talked to Warren uh, in, in 10 or more uh, years. But instead, they just manage their operations. And then if they generate extra cash at the end of the year, they send it to Omaha. If they need cash, they call Omaha. And that's that's really the extent of the of the interaction interaction with some of them. Others call regularly and talk to Warren all the time. But the the structure is extremely decentralized, very highly autonomous. It's based on trust rather than c control, and it works pretty well. They've had very few uh, problems or serious scandals. Buffett sends these men and women a letter every two years that outlines their job. And it's on a single page of paper, and it's six simple, very general ideas. Their job is to protect Berkshire Hathaway's reputation, to send bad news to Omaha early, um, and to nominate a successor, and to maintain a very long-term outlook. 50 years is, is the number he uses. Buffett urges all of these managers and personnel throughout the organization to think of one guiding idea that we call, he calls the New York Times test. This is the idea that in any decision that you're about to make, any behavior you're uh, embarking on, ask yourself, would you be happy to see this described in detail on the front page of your local newspaper by an intelligent but antagonistic journalist? And if, if you think about that, how you're going to sell your products, how you're going to collect your receivables, whether you're going to do this trade, how you're going to relate to your colleagues and so on like that. Um, you know, he believes, and I think the Berkshire experience vindicates the idea that your, your behavior is going to be far closer to the center of the playing field rather than at the edges. Uh, this hortatory is, is a very powerful 
uh, part of, of Berkshire culture, and it's, it's really the tone at the top Bur Buffett has set. Uh, and another great example of the, of the hortatory came in 1991 when Buffett was asked and, and reluctantly agreed to serve as the interim chairman of the board of Solomon Brothers, a investment banking firm that had been around for 100 years but got into a serious criminal bond trading scandal. Its reputation was was decimated and it was in very, very serious trouble. And Berkshire had owned a small, a per, some percentage of the stock. And so the, the board asked Warren to come in and try to steer the ship. And the first thing he did was gather all the traders at this big bank in a big room like this one and told them, look, here's how we're going to operate at Solomon Brothers. Um, this is the, the credo that you're all going to live by. And he said, if you lose money for the firm, even a lot of money, I will be understanding. But if you lose reputation for the firm, even a shred of reputation, I will be ruthless. I, I've got uh, tingles running down my spine right now. I don't know if that got you that same way, but um, that room full of bankers was impressed by this. And uh, he's, Buffett also subsequently testified uh, before Congress about uh, the Solomon Brothers trading scandal and, and you know, people maybe some pictured on the walls of this room, pressed him on what he was doing, what was happening at Sully, and he repeated that same thing. And he's been repeating that ever since. And uh, this kind of hortatory, this kind of ethical mandate, this tone at the top has extraordinary power. Uh, I think probably more powerful than um, some of the standard approaches to promoting a particular cultural or ethical behavior within corporate America, which tend to be of the command and control variety, tending to install uh, uh, layers of uh, middle managers and layers of supervision and uh, second guessing and uh, uh, procedures and policies and training and all of that. And I, I'm not saying that, any, that none of that is worthwhile, uh, but one risk of that mindset is that you encourage people to think about where the line is, and that can lead people to work right up next to that line. Rather than trying to stick in the middle of the playing field, people figure out, well, um, if this is okay, then I'll do it. If this is okay under the, the procedures and manuals and controls, then it's, then it's okay to do. And that will lead people to get very close to that, that line. And uh, at, at Berkshire, the goal is to keep people in the middle of the playing field, far away from that line. And so things like the New York Times test and this assertion, this, this hortatory about um, losing money versus le reputation is, is, is a part of that. I think the other thing that, uh, that appears throughout Berkshire and is worth internalizing across corporate America is, is the simple but, 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 um, but elusive truth that uh, be, beyond the ethical appeal of, of playing in the in the middle of the field. It's good business too. It's not just good morals, but it's, it's profitable. The subtitle of, of my book tries to express that idea, the value of values, that, that behaving in an ethical way, treating your customers as you'd like them to treat you, treating your shareholders as partners rather than mere inputs into a production function, that kind of behavior, while I think very appealing as a matter of ethics or morality, turns out to be the economically um, uh, wealth maximizing uh, proposition as well. After all, if you treat your customers as you'd like them to treat you, when uh, it comes time to collect, you know, they're going to want to pay. If you treat your employees the way you'd like to be treated, when, it comes to, when tough times occur and you need to uh, defer raises or renegotiate benefits programs, you're going to get more flexibility. And so um, th that, that's a very important um, uh, principle. I, I call it the golden rule, and I've got a whole, whole chapter on it. And I think, uh, again, it's a, it's a, it's a distinctive uh, feature of, of Berkshire, Berkshire Hathaway culture. And I stress now that this isn't perfect. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have um, rogues, uh, miscreants, and, and problems within the organization, but that on balance there's a case to be made that this kind of trust-based culture is net superior to a more command and control uh, type of culture. And finally, on Buffett's missive includes a 
advisory that the managers of the business units are supposed to think very long term. He tells them in that letter that he sends every other year, think about your business as if it was the only asset your family owned and it, you couldn't sell it, divest it, hypothecate it, to get rid of it for 50 years. And that time horizon is possible at Berkshire Hathaway because the, the parent is owned by this partnership group that has a very long time horizon. It's what the owners of the corporation see as well. There's no need, there's no pressure to make sure that in this quarter your sales goals have been achieved or that in this year you've achieved a particular profit margin. There aren't any loan covenants that require that kind of um, uh, focus either. And so the managers of the various units can look out as long as they want. If it takes a year or two or three to cope with some economic adversity, that's okay. Um, now, Warren is well known as a long-term investor. His favorite holding period for stocks is forever, he likes to say. But the more important point at, at Berkshire Hathaway is that its time horizon is indeed forever. It has not sold a subsidiary in 40 years. I mean, that, that's in total contrast to corporate America where the average holding period for a business unit might be three or five or seven years or something like that. I mean, General Electric's been in the news recently because the, the Jeff Emmelt, the CEO, has decided to, with, to get out of the, of the finance and, and lending business that, Ber that GE's been in for 20 years. But as you read stories about that company, you see he, he, he bought and sold NBC Universal. He bought and sold the plastics division. They bought and sold light bulb divisions, appliance divisions. And this GE is a good example of a company where they, they buy and sell assets and, and subsidiaries all the time. Jack Welch, terrific guy, was very famous at General Electric when he said that unless a business unit is number one or number two, we're going to sell it. Yeah, Berkshire is the absolute other way around. They make a promise when buying a company, never to sell it. And it's never breached that promise. That sense of permanence has enormous economic value, whether to sellers of businesses, like, like families who want to preserve a, an identity and a legacy, or entrepreneurs who, who want the security that, that they can make a three-year plan or a five-year plan or a seven-year plan, and the owners will have the patience to see it through. It's enormously valuable uh, to people. Many sellers of businesses to Berkshire, as a result, sold for less than rival bids or objective valuation. They sold to Berkshire because they valued for at a discount, because they also valued this commitment of permanence as well as the idea of autonomy, that these managers of the companies will be able to run the companies as they see fit, along with the other principles such as, such as reputation. So I document in the book numerous examples of cases where it was very clear that sellers sold to Berkshire at a, de at a discount, either because of, there was a rival bid on the table, you can measure it very clearly, or because of the economics. And that happened at Dairy Queen, Hellsberg Diamonds, NetJets, and, and numerous others. Here's a one representative case concerning R.C. Willie. This is a um, home furnishings uh, company based in Utah, originally run by a, run by a family. In 1995, uh, because of uh, uh, a third generation was running it and concerns about estate tax and, and, and estate planning, they decided to sell the company. But it was very important to that family to maintain the legacy and very important for them to have the grandchildren in management positions, and so they went out uh, and and tried to see uh, who might want to buy it and if they could get this kind of uh, uh, support or, or terms. And they had offers of of two hundred million dollars um, uh, and more. And they accepted an offer from Berkshire for one hundred seventy five million. And uh, I talked to Bill Child, who's the patriarch of the, of the company now. I said, How, "You guys left twenty five million dollars." <laughs> why why'd you do that? And he said, well, because at Berkshire Hathaway, he, you know, he said, he promised, Berkshire Buffett promised, uh, he'd hold us forever. And he, and he promised that we could manage the company as we see fit. And that was worth at least $25 million to me and my nephews and, and, and kids. The most dramatic example of this, I've got a whole chapter 
are a group of companies within the Berkshire family that I call corporate orphans. I'm referring to companies that had been through leveraged buyouts or ownership by private equity firms or through bankruptcy processes. And so they've been owned and sold and owned and sold and, and, and churned up. And experiences like that leave managers uh, very bruised and uh, often very aching for a permanent home where they can call the shots. And Berkshire is a perfect place. I tell stories of seven different companies that had that kind of orphanage experience and landed in Berkshire. And I'll just give you the example of Forest River. This is an uh, Indiana-based manufacturer of recreational vehicles that uh, went through three different LBOs. Uh, back in in the 1980s, right? Some some uh, uh, operator fond of debt would borrow lots of money, acquire the business, repay those loans by selling off some of its assets, uh, and micromanaging the CEOs of the companies to make sure they were able to generate cash to repay the debt. That's a leveraged buyout scenario. And so Forest River had been through through th three of these. Um, and a fellow named Pete Legal had been in various operating management positions during this, this process, and he was just bereft of the, 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 the whole time. He could never, they could never get a single business model organized and never um, uh, really run the company uh, successfully the way they wanted to. And so finally, at the end of one of the LBOs, the company went bankrupt, which is a very common ending to an LBO story. And so Pete, a uh, very entrepreneurial fellow who really cared a lot about this business, uh, uh, formed some capital for friends and families and went down to the bankruptcy court and bought most of the assets out of bankruptcy and then rebuilt that business with, with low debt, or really little, no debt, um, focused on his customers, operating autonomously, and he rebuilt the company to be a, a player in the industry. And once he'd done that, he sent Warren a two-page letter explaining what he'd done, what his business was, and acknowledging that he appreciates Berkshire's commitment of permanence and autonomy and lack of debt. And he'd like to sell the company to Warren. And they met. And within a couple of weeks, they, they had a deal. And Pete has now built Forest River uh, into an indus the industry leader now, with manufacturing facilities all across the country and, and leadership in, in this field, with no debt total autonomy and this, this absolute commitment to permanence. So in, in a way, permanence is, is Berkshire Hathaway's bedrock. It's part of the ownership base. It's part of the managerial base. It's part of the operating outlook. And to me, that fact alone, that feature alone, is, is reason enough to believe in, in Berkshire beyond Buffett. The whole point of this institution is, is permanence. And uh, now Warren is still at the helm, of course, and he may be for another decade or two. Uh, I certainly hope so. Uh, but it does raise the, the question, uh, the trillion dollar uh, question now of, of what will happen uh, to Berkshire Hathaway uh, when he's gone. I've got a whole, whole section in the, in the book on that. There's a pretty well elaborated succession plan in which his job will be split up in a couple of different ways and that the people who hold those uh, jobs will be people who have been working at Berkshire Hathaway who understand this culture that I've described, who will uh, faithfully carry out uh, their traditions. Uh, they will be helped uh, and supported by a board of directors that likewise is uh, fully uh, steeped in this, this culture and, and uh, committed to it. So um, for now, uh, I'll conclude, and I'll be happy to uh, take your questions, as, as uh, Anna, Anna said, um, uh, including about succession or, or any of these other things. But, but uh, for, for now, I'll just uh, stress that Berkshire's great fortune, which is considerable, I, I call it the trillion dollar question. I mean, the market capitalization of Berkshire now is 400 billion, the second or third largest company in the United States. Uh, and, and it growing like gangbusters, and so it, it'll, it'll, it'll be at a trillion in, in a decade or so. Um, and the, a, a, a considerable portion of that enormous value is due to this culture that I've been talking about. The, the ethical imperative, the ownership sensibility, the partnership orientation, the commitment 
of permanence and autonomy, the focus on trust. This culture has an enormous part to play in, in that value creation. And, it, and there's no question that Warren is personally responsible for a great deal of this because he believes in these kinds of values and he has set that tone at the top. But it has also been internalized across the culture. The board, the shareholders, the managers, and a lot of the personnel. So I think that it stands an extremely good chance of prospering even without uh, Buffett in charge. No doubt uh, a lot will change at Berkshire Hathaway if he's, if he's not there, but a lot will stay the same, and I think a lot of these values are, are part of that in durability factor. So thanks once again for coming and uh, listening, and I'd be, I'd be delighted to have uh, your questions as well. Thank you. You mentioned uh, General Electric. They're still around when Edison's long gone. IBM's still here. The Watsons are long gone and so on. I'm sure there's examples the other way. Do you know of any sort of systematic statistics about once a company gets into the Fortune 100 or something, uh, how do they, sur do they generally survive their founders leaving or, or not? That's a great question and I don't have any, any um, uh, formal statistics but do tell a few stories in, in the book about General Electric. And I know, I agree with you, that, you know, Thomas Edison's not there anymore, and it's changed a lot over the 120 years since he founded it. But some of what he did is still there, especially the entrepreneurial culture, the culture of, of, of frugal innovation. I mean, some of, the, some of the things that you still see um, all these years later are, are owed to Edison and successive CEOs who, even though they changed the company a lot, put their fingerprints on it a lot, still give tribute to, to Edison. So that's a good example of, of another, another uh, and, and IBM is interesting too, it's, it's changed an enormous amount, but, but people still do uh, give a lot of credit to, to the Watsons. Um, they named you know, the, the genius product uh, after you know, the, 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 the super computer is, is Watson. I mean, you know, another, another current example is Apple who's, you know, sort of guiding genius for so long was, was Steve Jobs. And after he died, people were, were, were quite skeptical that because, you know, he had really personified that, that company that it could survive. And um, after maybe some hiccups, it's actually prospering, I think, reasonably well under, under Tim Cook's leadership. So that's another example of where it's possible. A fourth example that cuts the other way is a company called Teledyne, which is, I think, most similar to Berkshire Hathaway. This was a company built by Henry Singleton beginning in 1959 through the 60s. And he, Henry was um, you know, a, 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 um, a revered, a creative uh, a businessman regarded by many as brilliant, and, and he assembled a vast conglomerate, uh, making opportunistic acquisitions, very much like Berkshire Hathaway. And um, and but then after 20 or 25, he, he they had water pick. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers remembers that or knows that it's a dental dental product. I mean, they had some neat inventions across a, a wide variety of businesses. Um, but by the late 80s or uh, early 1990, Henry decided, you know what? This company can't survive me, uh, and so he decided to dismantle it. And he, he broke it up into three parts. He spun some of them off. There's still something called Teledyne today, but it's very different from what Henry had put together. And so a lot of people think, isn't that the isn't that the Berkshire story? I mean, this you know, Berkshire Buffett's kind of like Henry, but except that he doesn't see that he you know that no one else is going to be able to do this. Um, and his answer, and I think it's, it's a credible one, is that, that Henry's business model was a hands-on model, his managerial model. He, he was involved in everything, including water pick. I mean, he, he was helping scientists figure out what would work and how, mark merchandisers how to sell uh, and so on. And Warren does none of that. And, and so I think Henry realizes, like, oh, man, I, I am in, I've made myself indispensable to this organization. Uh, and Warren has tried very hard to, 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 to not do that. Uh, we'll see if you know if it succeeded, but that's that's one um, uh, big difference. But uh, no, I, I've got to note uh, sort of a research agenda to to, to get the exact uh, exact data. But uh, uh, but uh, you know you do you know these business organizations do do change with with personalities and generations. Uh, GE is very different than it used to be. And I say, I mean, in 50 years, Berkshire will be very different from what it is. But I think I think these these basic these basic principles are are durable and so, and, and so long as people who understand and value them are, 
are leading the company, there, there's no reason it shouldn't be able to survive. I have a question. Thank you for the interesting talk today. And uh, I'm interested in charitable giving. And just as Buffett has paved the way around uh, business practice, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about his decision to merge his charitable giving with the Gates Foundation. Yeah, thanks. It's a great, great question. Um, Warren accumulated a, a vast fortune and did some modest giving along the way, but mostly just kept it all uh, accumulating in, in, in Berkshire Hathaway. He's given uh, uh, several billion dollars to foundations run by his children and his, um, his, his late wife. Uh, but the bulk of his estate, 60 or 80 billion or something like that now, he is giving to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation under pledges that began seven years ago. And so the plan is every, every year, Burke, he has been transferring a billion to the Gates Foundation. And then on his death, that, that practice will, will continue and will increase in amount for, for about 10 years. But virtually his entire estate is going to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And there's only one condition, uh, which is that they, they use the money. They spend the money. Um, uh, so they get a billion a year so long as they spent the prior year's billion. Uh, it's very easy for them, to, to, for them to do. That's the only string that's attached. And so this is classic Berkshire or Buffett it, giving total autonomy to, to the Gates Foundation to decide what's the best use of this money. And so he trusts. He's very close friends with, with Bill Gates and has been for a long time. Gates is on the board of Berkshire, and so they know each other as well as any two people might. And he, he trusts that, that Gates is really good, and Melinda, the two of them are very good at, at identifying best uses of, 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 of funding, whether for, for medicine, child liter, education, or, or so on. And, and so there are no strings attached. And it's to he, so he's managing his philanthropy if you like, in exactly the same way he manages Berkshire Hathaway. He said, I don't, you know, I'm not going to, he thinks, I'm not going to be the best person to decide whether it's Planned Parenthood or Catholic social charity or Catholic charity. She with me. Let Bill Gates decide, because he's really, he's good at this, and, and he trusts him. So, so it's, a, it's a remarkable, remarkable move. I've got a whole, and, and I do think that uh, Warren is, is unique. He's, he's tried to lead other billionaires to make the, the giving pledge where they give away half of their um, uh, wealth. Um, the people at Berkshire Hathaway have um, exemplified uh, generosity too. Uh, many of the people who founded the companies that Berkshire bought are billionaires. I mean, these are very valuable companies, and so these men and women are very, very rich. And uh, they, they all, or most, exhibit uh, uh, philanthropic impulses. So I've got a whole chapter, a whole section on um, the the charities to which um, a dozen different Berkshire leaders have given. I mean, some a billion dollars in, in, in quite a few cases. And what's interesting to me is the wide range of, of, of uh, donees, uh, universities, cultural, cultural institutions, uh, medical research, uh, the, the, whole, the whole gamut. But I think, so I think that's a, that's a little part of the Berkshire culture, too, is this sense of we, we were lucky or advantaged, and we ought to share a lot of that back. That makes me wonder if um, the charitable giving runs contrary to some of the other, particularly the, uh, some of the other things you brought up here, including impermanence, because if, um, and part of this is not knowing the ownership structure really of Berkshire Hathaway, but if uh, the, the shares, um, the return to the shareholders isn't coming through the form of dividends and cash, it's coming in the capital appreciation. So to recognize the cash, you have to sell it off. Well, if Bill and Linda Gates sell off a billion dollars of stock, they're going to probably sell it to a, um, a, a, a larger corporation, um, which is something that it sounds like Buffett really doesn't want to have Fidelity or uh, some, tre some uh, hedge fund owning a billion dollars worth of um, Berkshire Hathaway stock. Is that going to run counter to some of the other stuff he wants to achieve? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's a great, great question. And... Um, it's sort of an inevitable, you know, it's a reality that he, Warren will eventually die, and, and he owns, it, it, at the beginning, he owned 45% of Berkshire's voting and economic interests. Today, he owns 34% of the economic interest, and I'm sorry, 34% of the voting interest and 20% and of the economic interest. It's been going down as a result of these, these transfers, because he, he knows he's going to die, and he doesn't want to leave all the money to his kids. 
um, um, and but does have to do something with it. And so it may be a sort of a, a second best, but you know he's going to die. And so it's a it's an incremental, gradual, steady transfer. Uh, and uh, it's true that the Gateses will, uh, you know, liquidate and and it's sold into the marketplace. Uh, these publicly traded stocks, and so uh, I think when when the Gateses when the foundation sells, it just does sell orders in, into the marketplace. And so individuals, families, and so on, people who like Berkshire are still. Uh, as likely to be the buyers as as as, as large uh, large financial institutions. So, um, but you're you're right. His his you know, controlling block will eventually dissipate into the aggregate marketplace, and so the ownership profile will will be different. But it'll take a surprisingly long time, right? So he's already begun the process, and and experts uh, on on the administration of estates tell me that the process that they have planned out in his will could take up to 10 years. So it'll be a very gradual transfer through through the Gates Foundation into the into the marketplace, and so that'll give them a runway to to sustain some of these things. But but you're absolutely right that the, uh, uh, there is a chance that uh, you know a different demographic will emerge as a result of that process. But only a chance because if the company continues to com make commitments to these kinds of policies and practices, not every investor wants to own. Berkshire Hathaway. Plenty of investors will only buy stocks that pay dividends. So that will uh, exclude a whole group of people from, from any interest. But but it's it's a great it's a great point. And I think what they've done is is you know get the, the very best approach to this problem as 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 they can, consistent with the company's practices and, and, and goals. Um can you evaluate the worth of, of uh, Berkshire Hathaway stock in you know, what kind of valuation would you give it? And um, I guess how much growth can you expect as time moves forward? I think, uh, I think uh, Buffett said that not to expect what had happened. But And then uh, another question that I have is, are there any other companies with similar sorts of values that he, that he has? Well, in the valuation, I'm, I'm more of a consumer than producer of, of, of valuations, but I read them carefully, and there are numerous uh, appraisals of, of Berkshire Hathaway available uh, publicly. And my uh, my own reading of, of all of them is that it trades its, its market capitalization is a slight slight discount to intrinsic value, uh, almost no matter how you you calculate it. But you know, one one sort of macro view would be to say that you know a conglomerate like this. Um, is often uh, priced at a discount because of of opacity. It's it's hard to see all of the the, the, the discrete values of the individual units. I mean, take C's Candies for instance. I'm pretty sure that company, if you pulled it out of Berkshire and sold it to Nestle or Mars or or Hershey or something, would sell for four billion dollars. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the marketplace is valuing C's Candies within Berkshire at that full at that full premium, and and that's that's true for a lot of the companies. And so, um, but the valuation analysis that I've seen in the market capitalization approaching 400 uh, uh, billion evaluations I've seen suggest of um, conglomerate fully valued enterprise value at 420 or 430 or something like that. So um, on the second uh, point about prospects for, for growth, uh, Warren has been caution, uh, uttering that caution for, for 30 years. Uh, he's been growing the, uh, the business um, uh, steadily. Um, you know, since since 1965, but as early as the mid 80s, he was saying, "Look, don't don't expect us to be able to increase book value or returns on on equity at anything near like the rate we were able to do last year or last decade, because now we're much bigger and size is an anchor." And so, and he continues to make that uh, make that caution. And it's pro it's undoubtedly true that uh, uh, with the scale of uh, uh, of Berkshire Hathaway. There will just be far fewer opportunities to uh, invest large amounts of capital at at large returns, and so there's inherent uh, reversion to the mean. Um, that said, uh, you know he, they, they've been able to 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 outperform anyway, if the, even even if they have not uh, matched the performance of the of, of themselves uh, 10 or 20 years ago, they still have been able to outperform. Uh, the market uh, most years, and so so I'm I'm optimistic that they'll be able to do it. Uh, and one one really attractive thing lately is that Berkshire has acquired a railway and an energy company that require significant capital reinvestment at uh, at 
adequate rates of return, L large amounts of capital at, re at assured, uh, uh, rel you know, relatively attractive rates of return, not spectacular ones, but so that they've got a built-in uh, reinvestment vehicle that will, that will help at least mitigate the anchor uh, of size. Um, and the third point is that there are quite a few companies that uh, embrace many of the values at, at Berkshire Hathaway. Some um, uh, are conscious uh, imitators. I mentioned a few in the book. Um, for instance, there's a company called Markel Corporation, which is a third generation Richmond-based insurance company that, who under the leadership of John, uh, Tom Gaynor has done exactly what Berkshire <laughs> Uh, has been doing. Takes insurance float and makes acquisitions in a diverse range of businesses, holds them forever, gives managers autonomy, tries to instill this sense of ethical culture into the operation, and he's succeeding. It's a publicly traded company, and uh, um, the stock price is very high, <laughs> not quite Berkshire level, but, but he's doing it, and, and he's succeeding. There are quite a few others, and I think uh, there's nothing, nothing on the scale of Berkshire Hathaway, uh, but, uh, but there are qu quite, a, quite a bunch of, uh, of, of conscious imitators. Uh, and uh, I guess the other point that I'd make on, the, on, a, on this, this question is that I don't, and I've got a whole, a whole final chapter on you, know, what do you do with these ideas? What, what should we make of these lessons? Should an entrepreneur starting a business think, I'm going to make the next Berkshire Hathaway? I, as much as I love Tom Gaynor and, and what he's doing at Markel, I, I don't, I don't uh, uh, prescribe that. Uh, wholesale adoption, but instead to appreciate that these are very appealing values inherently and, and instrumentally and that they can work for you in a lot of different ways. It doesn't mean setting up a company just like Berkshire Hathaway, but, but appreciating the virtue of trust in, 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 in any part of, part of your life, maybe running a business or, or, or just leading a team or, uh, or even in family. So, so I think the virtues can be um, uh, uh, applied uh, one by one. And to that end, you see it all around you. I mean, the golden rule, you know, we, we, uh, we try to embrace, I think, you know, from third grade on or earlier in, uh, in our, our system. So I, I see these virtues and values all over the place. Thanks for your talk. Um, my question is about, uh, I guess, how enduring these ethical values are going to be when, uh, because it seems like part of uh, a major part of uh, Berkshire's success is based on the wise business decisions that uh, Buffett and, and his partner have made. Um, and I can see how the values can be, can endure, you know, these values of permanence can be passed on to others. But um, if the next generation of leaders there aren't making good economic decisions, if they're buying companies that uh, actually don't end up being successful if they're giving autonomy to people who don't, uh, who aren't making wise decisions. Um, can these ethical values like permanence actually hold if the economic decisions aren't good ones? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's a great question. Thanks, thanks so much. And it's, it's certainly true that a big part of Berkshire's success is the wise investment decisions and, and acquisition selections. But, but I should add that not all of them have been successful. They own quite a few companies that are, um, are struggling and that they haven't, haven't figured out what to do or deliver very modest uh, re returns. I mean, Seize Candies does not generate very high returns on equity. It, 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 but, but, you know, it generates positive cash and, and sends, it to, sends it to Omaha. Um, but, they're, you know, they're never, they're never going to sell it. Um, uh, f uh, the Pampered Chef is, is another another company. This this company sells uh, kitchen products, cooking gear, and uh, using old-fashioned Tupperware-type home parties. A very uh, quaint business model that has f failed or nearly failed. And, you know, they're working on it, but it's not a good business right now. Uh, NetJets sells fractional interest in uh, private aviation. And it has been bedeviled by high costs and even some labor unrest. It's not the, I don't, I think, I think Warren considers it a successful acquisition in a small sense that he gets to fly on that plane. In, um, but
But so they've made a lot of bad, you know, the bad, bad, bad investments. Uh, Dexter Shoe is a spectacular one. This is a New England-based uh, manufacturer of shoes, and they used to make them here. Um, and obviously, with container shipping and foreign labor, I mean, that, was, that business was decimated. But Berkshire paid $400 million in stock for that, and then 10 years later, it, you know, disappeared. It disintegrated. It was picked up by a cousin, H.H. Uh, Brown Shoe, Connecticut-based base company. So there have been some doozies. And, and so um, uh, so I think that now there have been some good ones too, obviously. And uh, so so I, I don't, so, you know, the, the, whoever succeeds Buffett and, and Munger will, you know, need to be, make wise economic decisions and succeed in their investments but, and, and acquisitions. But that, you know, we should all appreciate that uh, not all of them succeed. But if you, but you hold them anyway, you know, there's a lot of value to that. Um, you know, they're not selling C's, they're not selling the Pampered Chef, uh, at, at, at no sign of selling NetJets. Um, they didn't sell Dexter, they just let it disintegrate and then, and then housed it in, in a sister uh, subsidiary. Uh, so, so I think the successors will be allowed some, some room for mistake. Uh, I do think they will need to be skilled at acquisitions. They'll need to... Um, uh, you know, have have the ability to 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 say no when acquisition proposals come to them that they don't understand. They'll have to have that skill that Buffett and Munger have refined in themselves. They'll have to be able to uh, avoid paying stock in acquisitions, which is an important principle that Berkshire has has practiced. Um, so um, I, I think it's a, it's possible for the the successors to to have the this this ability. I think one advantage uh, that they'll have is is that they're going to be teams of people with with you know years of of, of lessons. Uh, Warren has not kept any of these things secret, right? These, these are widely uh, widely known principles and practices, and he's written about them every year um, in in the shareholder letters. Um, so you know, it, it's a I, I've got a picture here. If it went into succession, you know, here here are these two guys. They've they've done a phenomenal job at at, at wise economic decisions. Um, but then there's going to be platoons of people uh, helping to reinforce <laughs> that. And uh, so Warren's job will be split in two. There'll be a chief executive and a chief investment officer. Um, one of those, the, the chief executive is bound to have a number two. All the all the uh, managers of the Berkshire subsidiaries are required to, to name a successor, uh, so there will be an automatic uh, sounding board. Howard Buffett is going to become chairman of the board, and while he's not uh, he's not a, a businessman as such, he knows Berkshire culture and will will help um, to avoid dumb acquisitions or other decisions that would impede Berkshire culture. And then when you combine all of that with the with the distinctive group of shareholders. Uh, who who will reinforce the message as needed? The unusual board, the unusual managers, put it all together. I think you've got the best chance uh, of sustaining uh, this this system or this culture. Just one more question. Thank you. Um, it seems like the human condition itself almost needs oversight, and I was wondering um, how Berkshire Hathaway uh, sources and selects managers who can handle the culture and can, who can handle the autonomy without taking advantage of it or failing, um, and, and how we find successful people here that can do what they do under uh, such minimal oversight. Thank you. Thanks. And I'd actually, I'd connect that. That's a great question, too. I'd connect it to the professor's uh, question just a moment ago. Because in addition to the wise economic decisions and acquisition, you're also uh, acquiring a person or, or people. Uh, in other words, right, Berkshire Hathaway's acquisition philosophy is to buy companies that are already doing well and that are currently managed by uh, good managers. That's part of the uh, the acquisition philosophy. They, this is also unlike practice in lots of corporate America where a buyer will uh, try to buy a company that's not performing well that can be improved by changing management and so on. Berkshire's uh, approach is the other way around. They want to buy only good businesses that are managed by good people. And, and so they want to make a good economic decision and a good personnel decision. And the current filter for that uh, is Warren meeting with the fellow. And, and looking, and the typical meeting is, is, is not long, 
And the most important question that, that Warren asks is, is why are you in this business and why do you want to sell to me? And, and there are two broad categories of answers. One is it's, it's about the money, and the other is it's about the business. And if it's about the money, it's not a Berkshire kind of person, and, and, and Warren will say thanks, we'll, we'll pass. But if it's about the business, then, then the conversation will, will continue. And that's, I think, the first big, big, big filter that, uh, uh, and, and they, but, but Warren has to be convinced that this is a person who can be trusted, and that, that I will be able to count on this person to run Berkshire, uh, a Berkshire subsidiary uh, in a way that is consistent with these values, that, that vindicates the trust that I've, that I've put in him. And so that's, and I, I think that, may, maybe even more than the economic calculation, is, is the thing that might be hardest to replace, that is, um, uh, just, to, just to pick a name, uh, Ajit Jain is an often suggested successor to Warren. He runs one of the companies in reinsurance division. So is, is he going to have that skill to be able to sit down for one hour with this, this fellow who's running this company and say, you know, why do you want to sell to me? Why are you in this business? Uh, and is he going to be able to say, okay, you're a trustworthy uh, manager. Um, let's, let's, uh, let's go into business together. I, I think that's going to be uh, a, a harder uh, a harder hurdle. I think they'll they'll survive it. I think the men and women uh, in line to succeed uh, uh, Warren uh, ha have this kind of uh, ability. They're very discerning and they understand what to look for and, and what to watch out for. But uh, but I think that's the that is the hardest question. And again, uh, as with the economic question, while Warren's track record has been has been extremely good, it's not it hasn't been flawless. They have had managers who proved not to be trustworthy and embarrassed the company or worse. Um, I've, I, and I try to tell all those stories. There are six or eight CEOs of Berkshire Hathaway companies who disappointed for various reasons and had to be removed. Um, and, and so uh, I like your idea of <laughs> oversight of the human condition. There is, you know, there are bound to be these imperfections and, 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 uh, and disappointments. Uh, the surprising thing about the trust-based culture at Berkshire is how, how, how few, or the impressive thing, uh, is how, how few there have been. But there have been some and, and uh, there will be others. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. And feel free to come up and continue.